the nearer to the base, Crimea, the greater the effect. So they can choose what they want to do. There's no doubt in my mind that still the area from Topmat anchored at the top, uh, Melitopol, Berdyanska, and Mariupol is the kind of triangle of decision. They don't need to fill that with troops. They don't necessarily need necessarily to go beyond Melitopol and Berdyanska. It's up to them. But that is where the decision will lie in terms of strangling Crimea, and it's Crimea which is ultimately the prize here. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we're catching up with Major General Chip Chapman, who has 33 years military experience and is a former British military advisor to US Central Command. And he's a regular commentator here on Frontline and the author of Notes on a Small Military Chip. Good to see you again. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, can we start by talking about the ground part of the counteroffensive in Ukraine? And this week, it does seem that Ukraine is finally breaking through the Russian lines of defence in the south. Um, what have they had to navigate and how have they done it? Well, the first thing to say is that there are three lines of defensive lines from the Russians, the Sorovkin line. But what looks to be the case is that the Russians have front loaded most of their combat power up to 60 percent of their defences and minefields at the front end. This is not really in accordance with Russian doctrinal norms, but that's what they seem to have done. And I think partly that's um, tactical uh, from their perspective, but also partly political. It plays into the notion of Putin that the offensive, the counter-offensives has failed, which has been his narrative for a long time. Now, we now know, given that the first line of defence has been breached and that the uh, Ukrainians are through Robert Tart to Tinai and have reached the main trench line outside of Vobove, and they've only got 5.5 miles to go to the last set of defences around Top Mat. Now, I think the most important thing and relevant thing today was the report by the Defence Intelligence Agency in America, where they talked about a realistic probability that the Ukraine will break through the second and third lines of defence by the end of the year. Now, if you're an intelligence analyst, saying that something is a real, realistic probability in terms of probability yardsticks, which is what the intelligence community use, gives you an 80 to 95% certainty that that will occur, only bettered by nearly certain as a higher metric. So on an optimism bias, you can be certainly more optimistic than people were sort of calculating maybe um, a month ago. And the DIA is, of course, one of the big six in the intelligence community in America, one of the most prime agencies with a huge budget. So you can probably guess that the veracity of that is better than most. Now, if the Russians have front-loaded their defences, that means that the ability of the Ukrainians to go faster and further should be increased in the next few weeks. Now, of course, like all these things, there are variables which would play against that. And that is one of the reasons, for example, that the Russians have moved an, an elite formation, the 76 Guards Air Assault Division, to try and plug the gap. Um, the other thing, of course, is that Sorovkin, although the line is named after him, is not there. This is Gerasimov's uh, battle now or operation as the theater commander. Um, so, you know, he may, Sorovkin may have thought this differently than Gerasimov. So this really puts the Russians on a horns of a dilemma if the Ukrainians can do other things. Firstly, they could potentially do another sort of attack as a distraction through, um, through Kherson. But I think one of the things which people have missed in the last few weeks is the significance of the Crimea strikes. So the strike, for example, on Cape Top Hakut. Uh, was a very big, high-value target, taking out the Predal e radar, huge over-the-horizon radar, an electronic warfare system called the Lear-2, and an S-400 air defence system. Now, in military terms, this is something that we call taking those out, the ability to penetrate Russia's A2AD bubble. That's the anti-access area denial. So taking out those, what we would call an operation-level high-value targets, sets the conditions for increased attack and airspace penetration by the Ukrainians. So you've got the sequencing here of both the attacks in uh, Zaporizhia coming in with these 
uh, Crimea strikes, which is really going to set them up in terms of what they're doing in scale and simultaneity with the deep drone attacks of the Ukrainians and the close battle in uh, Zaporizhia to potentially be successful in the next three months. And the real success to do with this is that tactical battles, as I've said very many times, are fought in support of operational objectives. And the operational objective here is to break the land bridge to Crimea. And that really consists of a number of parts. Firstly, um, the railway runs through Topmac, 5.5 miles away. So that takes a significant part of the Russian traffic. The second thing is the M14, the highway which really runs uh, along from um, Mariupol through Berdyansk and to Melitopol. That's the M14. So if you can uh, take the first one, uh, that is sever the railway bridge, and put the M14 under, under artillery control, fire control, and if the Ukrainians can um, can knock over or stop logistics coming over the Kerchev Bridge, then the Russians are really in a poor position. And this is when we get to this real significant thing, it seems to me, for Putin, which is he's really got a choice between guns or butter. The Crimean people, he won't be able to supply both guns and butter to Crimea. So what do you do? What is the choice he makes? And the only way he could overcome that is by a significant Russian mobilization in the way that they did in what I would term phase five of the campaign last year, the mobilization which helped stabilize the line and led to the trench system, the Sorovkin line and others. But if they can't do that, then that's the end for Putin. If Putin, Putin is described uh, Crimea as Russian holy land. If he loses that or loses the ability to supply it, he's likely to be finished. Well, that's a very comprehensive answer to, to, to my first question. Thank you very much for that, um, Chip. Um, if we could just go back to, to getting through those uh, first line of defence um, and on to the second. Um, they're now fighting the first main continuous line of Russian positions in the trenches. Can you describe the, the kind of tactics, the elastic tactics that the Russians are using in their defence? Well, one of the things that the Russians should have done uh, is that they should have had a forward security zone with um, the number of troops deployed forward being less than those as you go further back, using fire support mainly from artillery to enable them to break the momentum and cause attrition, trading space for time really, before you can cause such significant casualties to the Ukrainians that their offensive becomes untenable. Now, the problem with that for the Russians has been that you might recall when we were speaking a few year, uh, few weeks ago that Popov, the commander of the 58th uh, Combined Arms Army, was sacked for telling, telling the truth. And one of the truths was that the Russians lacked counter-battery fire. So to forward deploy troops and use your artillery to support them, which, of course, you should, but if the enemy have more precise uh, guidance systems for their artillery precision guided munitions than you, then Ukraine has been winning the counter battery fire. So you're deploying your artillery to support your infantry and they're getting taken out. So the attrition of the Russian artillery has been significant, both in systems and in ammunition. And this is probably one of the catalysts for them trying to arrange some sort of um, meeting with uh, Kim Jong-un so that they can replenish their stocks. So that's not going well. Now, the whole thing about forward deploying your defences, as the Russians seem to have done, is that if you have less further back, an obstacle is not an obstacle unless it's observed and covered covered by fire. And so if the density of your, uh, your trench system and all the other things to go with it is less, as are the minefield density, that doesn't mean they can't still sow minefields because they can via artillery, then you're on, uh, you're on a kind of losing wicket. So as long as the Ukrainians can sustain their combat power and the logistics that go with it, then things look pretty good for them. So it's not a decisive breakthrough, and people have used that too often. It's a bridgehead which they can expand, and hopefully that will then gather uh, momentum as the next few weeks go on. But I do sense you're feeling quite optimistic an ounce of optimism is worth more than a general reserve, as uh, Field Marshal Wavell used to say. So I'm absolutely optimistic, uh, although I keep saying, Kate, there are many variables. Although the Russians have 
of uh, pushback, as I say, this A2, AD bubble. Uh, that's the anti-access area denial again, for those who don't know it. Um, there's still lots of variables there to do with uh, Russian air power, if they could bring that to, to bear in a, frankly, suicidal way, because the uh, Ukrainian air defense has been very, very good. And that's its own AD, uh, A2, AD bubble, which has prohibited the Russians from using a lot of close air support over the Ukrainian positions. Um, how urgent is it for Ukraine's forces in this part of the country to be able to get back, though, into a mechanised advance? I mean, you, you said that the first line of defence looks like it was the the, the, the the most difficult one to cross, and the second and third may be much easier because less time has been put into into, into making them such such obstacles to overcome. Um, but they've been on foot, haven't they, because of the minefields. Um, how urgent is it now to get back in their vehicles? Well, it'd be great if you could do that, you know, through the mud and blood to the green fields beyond, as the motto of the Royal Tank Regiment says. Um, if you can map out the where the minefields are by either satellite means or you know, by mapping means or captured maps from the Russians, then you have an ability to go faster. But, you know, the sort of um, how many kilometres or even hundreds of metres you can go in a day is really governed by... Uh, four things. It's uh, the four things which uh, is the relationship between the ground, the enemy, time and space and the density of minefields or the amount of air cover or the amount of artillery fire all play into that variable of how, how far you can go in a day. So it's difficult to have a metric which is going to say tomorrow they will advance 2Ks if they're successful at the second line, they'll advance 10Ks in a day. If you're really successful in historical terms, then you might be able to go 30 Ks, but who knows? It's just one of those variables in this form of warfare, which we've not seen for so long, that we really don't have those metrics to do that sort of staff yardstick on. Do, do you have a sense, though, about how far Ukraine's troops have to get to really start making the differences that they can make, the ones that you outlined earlier? I mean, do they have to get all the way down to the Sea of Azov, or can they actually start making a difference if they get closer by being able to attack the M14, for example? I mean, how far will make a real difference? Yeah, as long as they can get in uh, artillery range or precision guided munition range, fire control range, to hold the targets of the, the ports, the airfields, uh, around the port, uh, around the sea of Azov at risk, then that would be good enough as an interim. So it's holding that to ransom, being able to cut that at some point by using those fires, which would be important. And when we talk about uh, in the army GLOCs, grand lines of communications, it's often difficult for people to perceive why that's so important uh, because of the lifeblood of logistics for armies and civilians in Crimea, because there are so few routes. And the 20th century strategist Little Hart used to say that cutting those G-locks, the ground line of communications, if you, the nearer you cut it to the force, the enemy force, the more immediate the effect, the nearer to the base, Crimea, the greater the effect. So they can choose what they want to do. There's no doubt in my mind that still the area from top map anchored at the top, uh, Melitopol, Berdyanska, and Mariupol is the kind of triangle of decision. They don't need to fill that with troops. They don't necessarily need necessarily to go beyond Melitopol and Berdyanska. It's up to them. But that is where the decision will lie in terms of strangling Crimea. And it's Crimea which is ultimately the prize here. Yeah. And in that light, is, is strangling Crimea, cutting it off, is that the only way, or is that the way that Ukraine will win this war? Can it win the war without doing that? It is the most, most efficient theory of victory, I think, for the Ukrainians. I mean, first thing to say is no one really fights to the last man. That's, you know, just not something that happens. Uh, the second thing is they don't necessarily have to occupy all of their territory. Now, that doesn't mean that, of course, they shouldn't get all their sovereign territory back at the end of the war by the Russians... Um, Leaving the, ter leaving the territory, which will come either by collapse of the Russian army, as I said, or this political pressure on Putin becoming so significant that something has to give, and that's either some sort of putsch or coup with the Siloviki, the Tsar makers from the security service or elsewhere within the Russian system.
with winter approaching, is the I mean, there's a lot of pressure in terms of the the, the way this will affect the advance. Is, is there a point at which they have to get to the Ukrainian troops to really make a difference? Well, they have to get to a point where they can have um, fire control of the M14 near the sea of, sea of Azov. Now, just because it's the winter doesn't mean that fighting has to cease. So the pedology, the so- soil science of that part of Ukraine, occupied Ukraine at the moment, is different, for example, than the Pripyat marshes, are completely different um, avenues of approach, untenable avenues of approach from the Belarus, um, country of Belarus down to Kiev. So it might mean you have to fight differently. You use the power of partisans or light infantry before you bring people along cleared routes. But it doesn't mean that fighting ceases, as, as indeed it didn't in, for example, the Winter War in 1939-40, which led to a successful Russian offensive in the very, very cold winter of um, 1940, bringing the fin- Finns to a conclusion and a losing position which ceded parts of uh, Finland to Russia after that war. And what are the options for, for Ukraine uh, to uh, keep up the pressure during the winter and prevent Russian forces from rebuilding and regrouping over the winter in, in a broader picture kind of way? Well, I think they still need to continue the momentum both in the close battle to some extent and certainly the deep battle, the drone strike program against the Russians, A, to um, psychologically help to unhinge the Russians, but B, to show to the international community that there is still hope that this is going to be concluded in favour of the Ukrainians. Because again, one of the theories of victory for the Russians is that the West will tire of Ukraine and supporting Ukraine. Now, that is not likely to occur should um, there be amplifying successes as they get further south. And indeed, of course, they want to try and do that before the conclusion of 2024, because one of the theories of victory for the Russians is not only allied to um, the West losing interest, but it's to do with um, a change of government in the US. But again, on that... It's also worth saying that for the first time, if you do a weapons and um, and humanitarian aid and financial aid tracker, for the first time since the war started, the EU and associated NATO countries are now providing in both monetary and military terms uh, an equivalent amount to the, um, to the Americans. And in GDP terms, the Americans are now only 16th on the list of GDP providers And of course, it is those who are closest to the uh, front line, as it were, the Bucharest 9 coming down from the Baltic states through Poland and down through Romania, who in GDP terms are giving the most support to Ukraine. Um, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, um, he announced this $1 billion package to help Ukraine on his visit there this week. Um, The support ranging from components for air defence, missiles, small arms and ammunition to humanitarian assistance for mine clearance and more transparency and accountability over war crimes and corruption. And he says he wants to give Ukraine what it needs, not only for the counteroffensive, but for the long term. Do you think there's anything missing from this package? Well, there's always something missing in terms of timeliness, and it's the timeliness of the arrival of the uh, the equipment, which is one of the key things. So, for example, some of us might have been surprised by the fact that the announcement of Abrams tanks was about six months ago, and they're due to arrive in theatre this month. The first batch should arrive in the next one or two weeks. Um, I think the key thing about the component parts of both the, of both the EU support, which was announced this week, and the American support is that the first aspect is keeping the fight in the Ukrainians for now. It's providing anti-tank missiles, enduring artillery support, more air defence systems for what will probably inevitably inevitably be the attacks on um, Ukrainian infrastructure again to try and freeze the Ukrainians into submission and breaking their will. But also the second part was a multi-year support for the Ukrainians for the long term. So this seems to show to me that at the moment, NATO, the EU and uh, the e- and the US are still in this for the long term. You know, we keep saying, Biden keeps saying, we're in it until, uh, until victory is sort of achieved. That seems to be the case at the moment. But again, there are variables, as I keep saying, in terms of both internal support in countries, international support and perceptions of Russia. What we don't want to have is that um, useful idiots who 
play on the narrative of the Russians, try and force people's hands in terms of a false peace. Um, because one of the things as the Ukrainians become more successful is there will be more siren voices calling for an end to this, either in a truce or a ceasefire, sometimes on humanitarian grounds. But the problem with that is it rewards the aggressor and doesn't give any agency to Ukraine. So I'm absolutely against that. And it's the agency of Ukraine, which is the important uh, thing here, not the agency of the US or anyone else. An interesting thing that's um, been appearing in reports this week is um, Elon Musk. Um, there's been a lot of reporting about his threats in the past to withdraw his Starlink's communications, which have been so crucial in the Ukraine to Ukraine during the war. Uh, there's this new biography that's coming out, um, and it claims he actually has done this during a Ukrainian operation off the Crimean coast. He effectively uh, stopped, apparently, if it's true, um, a, an underwater drone attack on Russian warships. Um, what's your reading of this? Well, the first thing to say about the nature of this war is that this is one of the first wars, as far as I can tell, where you've had a profound commercialization of the battle space. And that is, it's not just Elon Musk and Starlink. You know, people have sort of crowdfunded drones for Ukraine. Uh, there are a lot of companies, particularly in the cyber domain, which are helping um, helping Ukraine. So this has been a, a re real difference from normal war where everything is funneled through sort of military channels. Um, that My instant reaction to this is it's very dangerous from someone like Musk, who, of course, is very wealthy and, you know, by his actions could determine geopolitics. I believe, and most people believe, that he has a certain take on this. His take is rather similar to Trump in the sense that he looks at this from what one might call a humanitarian peace angle. The humanitarian peace angle which is really something that Trump said at his town hall in May, is that he didn't look at this in terms of winning or losing. He looked at it in terms of stopping the killing. The problem with that, it's very honourable in its own way, is that, again, it rewards the aggressor. Um, so that's, again, not something that I could subscribe to at the moment. Um, so there are a number of variables there where it's elected politicians and the strategy bridge between the military and elected politicians, which should be the arbiter of strategy, not what Elon Musk says. Yeah, and I mean, he, he was saying that he did it um, to avoid repercussions for fear of that. Um, don't know if that's true or not, but well, um, it's interesting. Go on, sorry. Well, I think the key thing of one of the things that Elon Musk said was that he did it in terms of he feared escalation. Now, there are seven types of escalation, which are, I've talked about many times as escalation by weapons, objectives, targets, geography, domains, you know, space domain or cyber, by rhetoric or by um, a seventh one, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, again, you know, people have managed uh, escalation quite well at the moment. And one of the things which we've seen from this war is that deterrence has worked quite has worked quite well at the moment. So no red lines have been crossed by Russia into uh, NATO uh, territory. And, you know, it'd be mad for the Russians to fight a second front. So all the rhetoric that we see, and we see it on a weekly basis, really, in terms of either nuclear strikes or, you know, if the F-16s are provided, this will be deemed to be an act of war or something akin to that. All those lines have been crossed for uh, by NATO managing sort of escalation uh, in a very, very coherent way, in my opinion. Yeah, you say no, no, no red lines have been crossed into NATO territory and um, that deterrence is working. And Downing Street in the UK is now saying that it's using RAF aircraft as a deterrence and surveillance over the Black Sea to protect any illegal strikes that Russia may make against cargo ships shipping grain in the area. Um, and then you have the, 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 the thing that happened this week with this drone strike on Ismail, which um, fragments of which have landed, we now think is true in Romania. I mean, the, the idea that, that something small could escalate into something quite big that involves NATO is always there, isn't it? Not as much as people think. Now, there is no legal definition of war. Um, War is, is in the political domain. The UN Charter asked people to refrain from war. 
under Article 2, brackets 4, close brackets, and actually says there are only two occasions that one can go to war. One is if it's underpinned by a UN Security Council resolution, and the second one is in Article 51, if it's in self-defence. Um, so to say one is at war, or we are at war, is of course a political decision. So a a strike or a drone coming down in Romania or another NATO country does not really mean that we're going to go out to war with uh, with Russia. Indeed, we got some evidence of this in uh, the last few years because, of course, in 2015, the Turks shot down a Russian plane over their territory, which had crossed the border in Syria. Um, Russians didn't like that. Uh, that led to an Article 4 consultation uh, within NATO and Patriot missile batteries being placed on the Turkish border, but didn't lead to anything other than that. That's what I think would happen. Uh, if there was a significant um, strike by Russians on scale, uh, that would alter. And one of the key things generally is, uh, are people killed? And that might be a criteria which leads to that. But again, managing this escalation has been pretty well done at the moment. So, sorry to interrupt, but but in, in that light, then so a miscalculation, um, some kind of error, then is is not of concern, then. No, it will be over. It's overplayed, in my view. Okay, interesting. And um, so, as we approach the end of the year, uh, with, with this kind of heightened optimism that there is with this counteroffensive, wh where do you think we're going to be going into the new year? Is it possible to say at all? No. Um, the reason for that, <laughs> in terms of um, no one can predict uh, when a war will end. Um, I always say that there's three things. Um, will people fight? How well will they fight? And for how long will they fight? You can't really answer that question because that's in both the moral and physical domain, both for Russia and Ukraine. What it is true to say, though, is that total means are multiplied by your strength of will gives you your power of resistance. The power of resistance of the Ukrainians is far greater, I deem, than it is for the Russians. When you step back yourself, though, and look at this this war in Europe, um, what do you notice? What are your takeaways at, as we stand at the moment from it? What, what have you learned? Is there anything that surprised you? I don't think there's anything that's really surprised me. I think one of the one of the interesting things is that we often look at the last wars and make the wrong judgments from them. So the two last wars, really, for us in looking at the future of warfare, were the Nagorno Karabakh. 44 day war in 2020 and Operation Guardians of the Wars, the um, Israeli operation in I think 2021. Now, people said um, that the first uh, of those operations that it was um, showed that the, the power of drone warfare. Um, it did in the sense that um, the, it was the first war in which unmanned systems had destroyed manned systems on the ground. But you can draw too much from that because one side was very bad and the other side was very good in terms of their training and their posture. The second war I mentioned, the Israelis, that was deemed to be the first AI war when machine learning and supercomputing allied two satellites had been used. All those things we're seeing in Ukraine. We're also seeing, as I said, the commercialization of, <coughs> of the battle space by the contribution of uh, civilian companies. Um, but the nature of war doesn't change. It's visceral. People get killed. It's pretty horrific. The character of war may change. Uh, although people say that you know drones have changed the character of war, I would kind of argue that that's really just an extension of one of the variables which led to success in land operations in the 20th century, and that is control of the air. Major General Chip Chapman, it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. My thanks to today's producer, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. If you'd like to support us, you can subscribe now or listen to Times Radio for the latest news and in-depth analysis or go to thetimes.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.